is the reading of the New Testament. May we be blessed by its message. Today's sermon, are we hiding from God like Adam did? I'll start with a story. When I was a preteen living in the small burg of Rock Grove, Illinois. How many of you know where Rock Grove, Illinois is? Interestingly, I learned one week, some months ago, that there was a, a family that was brethren in Rock Grove, Illinois, and they had a they had a big a big to do at their farm. I don't think it was an annual. I know it wasn't an annual meeting, but it was something that they had at Rock Grove, and I was so surprised and shocked to see that in our history book. That that's where I grew up, Rock Grove, from ages ten to eighteen or so. Before that, it was in Freeport. So when I was a preteen and living in this tiny town called Rock Grove, it's literally one main street and one side road, and you blink and you miss it. I loved to ride my bicycle to a certain destination where I felt peace and comfort. I had a tough childhood, and seeking out a place where nobody could see me, but I could see all of them drive by, felt comforting. It was just me and God, sitting under that mulberry tree, on a little hill overlooking the main highway on the east edge of town. These were the times I hid from my parents to escape that which was so painful, if even for a little while. And while I hid from them, I took solace in God and nature. As a child, I had trouble seeing and hearing God. It wasn't until I was an adult that I felt I had more of a direct connection with him. After about 40 years of trying, and let me tell you, as a child, I did try. The church was two doors down from our house. When Bob and I first met, I took him out and showed him where I grew up. And it was just the preacher's house was right next door, and then there was the church. And it was never locked. So when I would come home from school during the day, I could go in, close the door behind me, get on my knees at the altar and pray. Whenever... That happens for all of us. Whenever we finally see God and let God see and hear us, we wonder, do we really do that? Do we really go out of our way to try and reveal ourselves to God so that he reveals himself to us? So many try and fail to make that connection, giving up in the process. We feel a little empty inside looking around at other Christians and wondering, where's that miracle? that lets me touch and feel God in my heart. But when it does happen, we could be hiding ourselves away from God because we don't want Him to see us as we truly are. We want to dress up our sins, and we like to think of them as either not really sins, or that God will forgive us in any case, so why dwell on it? To see ourselves as God sees us, we must come to realize that we cannot be the person God intended us to be, like Adam, if we continue to shield our eyes from the truth, the truth of our infirmity, the truth of our disbelief, our failures, our shortcomings, and our disobedience. We then get into a habit of not only shielding our eyes from that which we cannot bear to see, we shield them from our very own selves, and we try to shield ourselves away from God, and we do it subconsciously most of the time. My former mother-in-law, Carolyn Romer, lived the horrors of cleaning out concentration camps under General George Patton. And as you can imagine, and who can blame her, she could not bear to see any movies focused on war or bloody conflict or listen to stories along the same line. Everything had to be happy. Otherwise she'd be pulled back into that pit of despair that she suffered through during those post-war days. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with her seeking joy all the time. She struggled, and that war affected her deeply. But she missed some of the greatest art ever made, particularly movies full of human compassion, such as Schindler's List. Who among you has seen Schindler's List? Doesn't it bring you to tear and joy? And the piano... One of my favorite World War II movies about survival and hope. These 
these kinds of artists' renderings, whether they're on the silver screen or hanging on a wall, reveal mankind in their own genre and sad beauty, not only the evils of war, but the horror of allowing racism to fester, the truth behind the madness when evildoers come face to face with the product of their efforts, the compelling tragedies of misery, fear, and despair, still living in hope that God hears them and sheds his mercy upon the souls of the war-torn forgotten. War is not something we can ignore, and we are forced to consider it when closely reading our Old Testament, if not the newspaper. Even as conscientious objectors and arbiters for peace, it shoves its way into our lives, forcing some of us to even abandon our commitment to not kill and take up arms. Many brethren have done that in the past when faced with the urgent need to defeat evil. Despite the emphasis of love in the Bible, particularly the New Testament, within the New Covenant, we still come to realize that many turn their faces away and they hide, but it is impossible to truly shake the Word of God from our souls once we have been baptized into Christianity. In coming out from under our rocks, we can look for inspiration in the Word, our Holy Bible, and we will come away with the shocking realization that not one of God's people in the Bible tried to hide from him after Adam. Not one. Sure, Jonah ran away for a bit, but he was reluctant to do God's will. But other great characters in the Bible do not try to run from God. They try to do God's will. I, I even asked my, my professor of my my Bible class that I'm in right now, I couldn't think of any. I went through the Bible. Is there anybody else who actually hid from God? And he said no. Jonah ran away and was reluctant, but he eventually came around, and he didn't hide. They are aligned with God. They raise their hands and say, What about me? What can I do? Here I am, Lord. I'm not sure if King David, the subject of our devotions today, ever ran away from God, but I'm sure he thought about it, even though he ultimately realized, as evidence in his poetry, that he could not escape the eyes of God. Indeed, David was the youngest of the sons of Jesse, not considered beautiful enough to be king at first, but in the end was the one chosen by God. When God reminded Samuel how to seek out the qualities of a king, saying, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, for the Lord does not see as mortals see. Mortals look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks on the heart. Young David, in fact, the youngest of all of Jesse's sons, is the one finally brought forward from the fields where he was tending the family's sheep herd. Samuel, under God's watchful eye, anoints the chosen David to be king of Israel. And David is an able king, but is plagued by many temptations, not the least of which is Bathsheba. In Psalm 139, David wrote, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. So I got to thinking about why that is, why only one biblical character actually hid from God when God called his voice. It's normal to shield ourselves in fear and trembling from the master of the universe. What does he want? What could he want from us? 
How much time will he take from the things I really like to do in life? In fact, our human habit is to quickly turn away from that which we cannot bear to witness. Just like my former mother-in-law, she was human and we are all human. But I'm not really focusing here on trying to hide from God because we have fear. I'm asking us to consider if we try to hide from God because like Adam, we are ashamed of our failures. And whether we know it or not, we feel unworthy and our hiding is how we manage those feelings. My friends, those are the times we turned away when we should have turned toward His Majesty. The times we held wicked thoughts about another human being when we should have shown love. The times we hurt a brother or sister when we should have embraced them. These moments are the moments when we hide from God. We don't get under a closet or under a table. We just put God over in our corner cabinet. We shut him, shut him away. We go out about our ways as if he isn't watching. To understand why hiding from God is futile, however we manage it, we must admit to ourselves that he is everywhere, like the psalmist King David wrote. Adam showed it to us in the very beginning of the good book we so love to read. He tried to hide, but he failed. David, the king and the psalmist, is devoted to God and cannot stand those who hate God and pervert his ways. And the New Testament teaches Christians to love their enemies but still hate evil and call sin what it is. Love of good produces hatred of evil. And the psalmist does not restrain his passions. Yet David knows that he too has fallen. And in his current state, he needs God's searching light to purge the hidden darkness of his soul. Thus through the prophets and sages and kings and psalmists, the answer becomes clear to us. It is futile to hide from God because he created in us the desire to seek his wisdom. He created in us the physical need to seek his guidance. And he created in us the desire to be cleansed of our sins that we may be bathed in the light of his love, that we may be whole, that we may be happy. He created in us the need for him to perpetuate mankind. Be fruitful and multiply, were his words. God certainly sees us, for there is no hiding from the truth of the master of the universe. There is no hiding the truth from him. It's better, for it is ordained, my friends, to keep our eyes wide open, to stand as our forefathers did two millennia ago, to say, here I am, God. I've heard you calling in the dark. How can I promote your kingdom on earth? Last Monday, I sat in on the community church council meeting so that I don't have to drive to and from Franklin Grove a third time in the week at night. They put me on a speakerphone and I participate that way. And this past week, a woman who I did not know at that meeting named Dawn Summers, some of you may know Dawn, told us stories about the joys of housing Ukrainian refugees who fled from the war to the United States and ended up in her home. The little boy among them runs to the door every day when she gets home, asking if there's anything he can do for her. Can he carry something in for her? He's seven years old barely speaks English. They are learning and they are trying. The sad beauty of war softened with Christian responsibility sounds like it's definitely on display in the Summers household in Dixon. I think we should try to help that family somehow for they are just down the road. The evils of war, the horror of allowing racism to fester, the unkindnesses and lies 
a human being can spread these kinds of truths, reveal the saddest truth of all, that there are so many of us hiding from the miracle of God, revealed to us in all its majesty by his Son who came to show us we must bow down. We must stop hiding. We must come out into the light. There's a reason. There's a reason there is only one human in the Bible story, Adam, who hides from God. Everything is in the Bible for a reason. The first human and the only human for God revealed his power, stripping mankind of his painless life on earth because of his disobedience, replacing it instead with tears, trials, and subservience. Instead of hiding as Adam did, God urges us to stand up. Our free ride, once offered, was dashed in the fall. We must get busy and take care of ourselves and those we love. After Adam, there were no more free lunches. The man did it to himself. He ate of the tree of knowledge, along with Eve, and his destiny, and thus our destiny, was then foretold. There would be pain. There would be suffering. There would be sadness and woe. There would be war. And even though the story of Adam and Eve is possibly just an allegory, there is so much truth to it, so much wisdom in it. It's the beginning of the story of mankind. Now after Adam and Eve leave the garden, God urges us thusly through the eons via his priests and his prophets, Abraham, Isaiah, Jacob, Elijah, Elisha, Moses, Micah, Samuel, and Ananias in the, good tes- in the New Testament. Jesus Christ said, here I am, implicitly because he gave his life for us. Through devout females, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, Ruth, Esther, Hannah, Rachel, all these men and women of our past, these people of faith, came to terms with him. All believed in him, and none of them hid from him. We see, instead of fear or shame, the great priests and prophets trembling at the altar, saying, Here I am, Lord, how can I serve you? They stood up to be counted when they heard. And they were. They were counted. They saw God. And he saw them. And so we learn to be servants of God on high, led to his great majesty by the Son, Jesus Christ prodded by the Holy Spirit within, asking us to move closer, unshield our eyes, open up that corner cabinet, unshield our hearts. If the entire Bible story is the inspired word of God, and if the meaning of the Bible is to promote the kingdom of God, then let us stand up and be counted and never ever look away. And for crying out loud, let's stop hiding. As Adam taught us from the start, there's nowhere to hide. And all our efforts to do so will be useless. Even so, there is one kind of hiding that is fine with God. In fact, it is preferred. In fact, it is ordained. What is it, you might ask? We should hide in him. When we walk, we should imagine God walking beside us in friendship and fellowship. Whenever the world gives us troubles, problems, or make it, or makes us afraid, we can put God's promises in our hearts as easily as we put a hat on our head. We've all experienced it lately. That fear of the unknown, the thing that's happening that's troubled or scared us or frightened us. I experienced it with my son Jonathan and his wife Christina. I'm sure Ray experienced it when he went in for surgery. Ellen, when she went in for her eyes. Susan has a ton of stories to tell about that kind of fear and anxiety. Whenever the world gives us those troubles, those problems, or makes us afraid, we can put God's promises on our heart. Like we put that hat on our head, it keeps our head warm. 
from the cold, just like God keeps our hearts from erupting due to our troubles. Whenever we're not sure what to do, we're formed and created to turn to God, not to hide from him. In fact, we may be genetically disposed to do so. It could very well be proved genetically someday that God's divine will is inside us, not just in our cultural patterns handed down from our ancestors, but in our genes. It occurred to me a few days ago that the reason we can't hide and should not turn away from God is because we're made with genetics that preordain our spiritual behavior to one degree or another. There is actually ongoing work on this topic. In his book, The God Gene, which was written in 2004, How Faith is Hardwired into Our Genes, author Dean Hamer argues that a variation in a gene called the VMA2, our genetic material, plays a role in man's openness to spiritual experiences. Culturally, denominational religion itself tends toward heritable tendencies. Our parents might have been brethren. Our grandparents might have been brethren. That's heritable, our denomination. But while it is still being argued on the scholarly stage, Hamer concludes it is high time we figure that out, whether or not we are ordained by our internal mechanisms, by our DNA, to be more or less inclined toward turning our eyes to a higher divine sacred power. No wonder we can't run away from it and hide. The idea of God gene reminds us of long-held faith conversations as to whether a person's religiosity is determined by free will or an uncontrollable destiny, which we would call divine providence. In Judaism, discussions about divine providence have become the subject of much rabbinic literature and philosophy. These writings often ask to what extent God interferes in the details of a person's life. I don't like the use of the word interferes. I think of it as merges. In other words, is a person's religious behavior guided by her own choices or by some immutable force, be it God or DNA? Those of us who turn away sometimes, we stay away sometimes, not only from the building, but from God. Most of us come back. For Christians, God is our secret, immovable, hiding place. He is our special fortress. And whenever life overwhelms us, we always run to him. And knowing all this, I often ponder how it is possible to ignore God, to become an agnostic or an atheist, as 20% of Americans say they are. draw near to him and he will draw near to you hide in his comfort and his encouragement seek him through prayer and keep your mind on God because God's presence is near and you are protected in closing I often like to tell that story of driving home with Jonathan during a massive storm when he was about 12, so bad that I was terrified and began praying to get home safely. And I began to pray. And that is how I brought God beside me to travel with us until we reached our destination. He wasn't in the vehicle, but he was in my presence, in my head, in my hands, and in my heart. And we got home safely. And I've been safe my whole life, while so often feeling afraid, truly afraid. It's taken me a lifetime to realize that all fear and anxiety was so swiftly and easily washed away by the power of his love, the security of his promise, and the knowledge of my faith buried deep inside because God's word remains living and active. It continually exerts its power and always fulfills its purposes. The word is sharper than any double-edged sword. 
The word of God can strike at our conscience, heart, and mind. It can wound us so that it might heal us. God wields his word like a weapon which strikes against sin and seeks to kill those indwelling vestiges of rebellion that pop up inside of us every so often. None can hide from God's sight. There are no secret sins. And hiding blocks our fellowship with the Lord. That's why walking with God instead of trying to hide from Him is the only way. Seeking His forgiveness and repenting of our past sins is the path toward the restoration of this fellowship. And be not ashamed, for there is a blessing in our sin and brokenness. There's a blessing in our sin and brokenness. For God finds those of us who have walked in the dark without him to be of great value. The prophet Jeremiah told us that in chapter 15, verse 19, that a person who has been broken and repents like King David is of great usefulness to the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. If you repent, I will restore you that you may serve me. If you utter worthy, not worthless words, you will be my spokesman. Our faith in him is our rod and our staff. And they do, in fact, comfort us, do they not? Let us pray.